first time working with a new band. I'm getting things set up on stage, and the lead singer comes up to me, and she says, um, would it be okay if we used my microphone? Well, of course. I'm a big proponent of vocalists using their own mic, provided that mic is suitable for live performance, of course. And she says, well, I'm told it's a really good mic, but our last sound guy, you couldn't use it because it requires phantom power. I thought that was a little unusual, and uh, I thought, these phantoms are nothing to be afraid of. So in this episode, we're going to break it down. I'm going to break down what phantom power is, how it works, some of the places where you could actually damage equipment and need to be careful with phantom power, and some best tips and practices, at least according to me. So, stick around and let's turn it on. If you're a subscriber, welcome back. If you're not yet a subscriber, I would encourage you to reach down and click that subscribe button. And the reason for that is because I know I've seen some interesting content on YouTube and I try to find it some point later. And if I'm not a subscriber, I sometimes just get lost in the search and can never find that channel once again. In addition, if you click the subscribe button, that's a signal to YouTube that people are appreciating this content and they'll suggest it to more folks and that helps this channel grow. In addition, if you click the notifications bell icon, you'll be notified when new content drops and you won't miss anything interesting. Phantom power is an industry standard method of delivering a small amount of electrical power to provide the power necessary to run active devices at the end of your microphone line. Now, it's a very minuscule amount of power, so you're not going to run fans on stage or anything like that, but it can be used to power things such as direct input boxes that are active, that have active electronics in them, or condenser microphones, like so. Now, most of the things that we plug into our PA system do not require phantom power. Things such as dynamic microphones, like this Shure 57. A dynamic microphone operates like a loudspeaker, but in reverse where you have a diaphragm that has a coil of wire attached to it in front of a magnet. That diaphragm gets vibrated by sound pressure coming in the front, which shakes the coil of wire in front of a magnet, and the magnetic field imparts into that coil of wire a changing voltage in proportion to its vibration, which can be sent out the back of the microphone and into your sound system. And that will represent the sound coming in. They work well. A condenser microphone, on the other hand, uses a different kind of element that doesn't directly generate voltage. It changes its electrical characteristics based upon the sound pressure that's hitting it. And those changes in electrical characteristics need to be sensed by some active electronics to convert that into a varying voltage signal that can be sent down the line into your PA system. There are excellent microphones that are dynamic, and there are excellent microphones that are capacitor microphones or condenser microphones. Generally speaking, condenser microphones use more lightweight elements in them, so they are able to better reproduce transients and high-frequency sounds. So you often see these kind of microphones used for things such as hi-hat pickups or cymbals and that sort of thing. Now there's a lot of good general purpose condenser microphones out there that can be used for lots of things, like uh, picking up acoustic guitar. And right now I'm using a condenser microphone, a Shure KSM, for the vocals on this video presentation. But in order to run a condenser microphone or an active DI box, they need some electrical power to operate the electronics within. Some of these devices have an option for putting a battery into the microphone or the DI box, but most professional microphones expect to be running off of phantom power, which is delivered down the microphone line. Now this is called phantom power because the electricity is delivered to the device through the microphone line, but it is invisible to the audio signal coming back. So let's break this down as to how it works. If you look at the bottom of your microphone, you'll see a 3-pin male XLR connector. Those pins are numbered 1, 2, and 3. 
If you look carefully, you may see that they're demarked on that connector. The pin on the upper left is pin number one. That is ground, and it is connected to the handle or the case of the microphone. On the upper right is pin number two, which is the positive signal output. Not all mic cables have the same color scheme, but I would expect that pin to be connected to the red cable inside of your microphone cable. The pin down below is pin number three, which is the negative signal output, and I would expect it to be connected to the black wire on your microphone cable. Here is a simplified diagram of a dynamic microphone connected to a phantom power input. Your dynamic microphone may have some additional components inside of it, such as a mute switch or a transformer that couples the impedance between the microphone element and the mixing board, but those components are not important in terms of this diagram. You'll see that there's connection numbers in the diagram on the right-hand side, labeled number two, number three. You see the number one is ground, and those reference the pins that we talked about earlier on the microphone connector. So you'll see that the microphone element is connected to pins two and three, and the outer case of the microphone is grounded going to pin number one. You'll see that there are two power sources which represent phantom power at 48 volts, which are energizing pins two and three, and they are connected to ground on the negative side. But you'll see that the signal coming out of the microphone only goes to pins two and three and does not connect anywhere to ground. So therefore, the 48 volt power supply cannot pass through the microphone element because there's no circuit path there. So therefore, the dynamic microphone will not be impacted at all by the 48 volt supplies that are hanging off of the pins two and three signal lines. If this was a condenser microphone, you'd see some electronic circuitry inside of it, which is hanging off of ground and one or two of those signal lines in order to receive its power supply. So, as you can see, if you plug a dynamic microphone into a input that has phantom power enabled, that phantom power really should have no effect whatsoever on the microphone. It shouldn't affect the sound quality, and it should basically be invisible to that microphone, assuming everything is wired correctly and it's a balanced circuit. Now, on the other hand, if you're using an input that is not balanced, and you are tying, for example, pins 1 and 3 together on that connector, and you apply phantom power, now the phantom power is actually going through the device and you could create problems. It could put an undue load on your phantom power supply and it could also possibly damage the device at the end of the line. So we need to be careful when using any kind of adapter cables with phantom power. We need to make sure that the connection is properly balanced from end to end. In addition, ribbon microphones are sensitive to phantom power and sometimes ribbon microphones can be damaged if phantom power is applied to them. So make sure to have your phantom power turned off on those channels that have any kind of unbalanced connection coming in or adapter cables going into that mic input that could create an unbalanced connection or ribbon microphones. Phantom power is pure DC power applied to both signal lines on your balanced connection. Now the preamp is looking for a difference between those two signal lines for the signal, and so therefore the phantom power should be completely invisible. However, at the time that you switch phantom power on or off, or plug in a microphone, that's going to create a big spike across those lines, which will be detected by the preamp and could create a loud, nasty bang coming through the PA system, which we want to avoid. So I think the best practice would be to mute the channel and turn down the fader. Turn off phantom power. Attach your microphone. 
then turn on the phantom power. The reason for that is because when you plug the microphone in, the three pins in the connector actually make connection one at a time. And I want the phantom power to come up on both those lines simultaneously. I don't want it to be on just one line of the microphone. So once the microphone is plugged in, we turn on phantom power, we wait just a moment for everything to settle down, like a second or so. And then you can unmute the channel on the board and turn the fader back up. And by following that procedure, we won't get any clicks or pops through the PA system. Likewise, when we go to shut down, I first mute the channel, then I disconnect phantom power, and then I disconnect the microphone connector from the system. The industry standard for phantom power is 48 volts DC. So any device that says it works with phantom power should work with a 48 volt DC phantom power source. There are some devices like this portable recorder that have a selectable phantom power voltage. So you'll have a setting on here for 48 volt phantom power. But there are also other settings that might offer, for example, 24 volts or 15 volts or 12 volt phantom power. And the reason for that is because it requires less battery power in this device to run phantom power at a lower voltage. So by choosing a lower voltage, you may be able to get a longer battery runtime out of some devices. Now, whether or not that will work with your particular microphone, well, that varies. And so before changing to a lower voltage and phantom power, you have to make sure that the devices that you're driving such as your condenser microphones or your DI box will happily run at those lower voltages. Some will and some won't. Now if runtime or batteries are no issue, I would always choose 48 volts because that's the industry standard and I know that basically everything that's designed to work with phantom power should work properly. But if I'm doing a photo shoot and I'm running on batteries, and I know that my microphone will happily run on 15 volt phantom power, I may make that choice in order to extend my battery life. Should phantom power be left on on your studio microphones? Well, my answer to that would be generally yes. The amount of power that is being consumed by phantom power is minuscule, and so it's not going to affect your electric bill. Does it really make a big difference? Probably not. But generally, I would keep the power on because equipment tends to fail most often when power is applied, and so reducing the number of power cycles will likely increase the longevity of the equipment. Now, if I was going to stop my session and not get back to it for a week later, well, yeah, in that case, I'd probably turn everything off. But if I was going to just take a break for an hour or two and come back, I'd probably just leave everything cooking. I, I think the bigger issue with capacitor or condenser microphones, as with all microphones really, is that they're sensitive to moisture and dust. And so if I was going to leave a microphone out for an extended period of time, I think it would be a good practice to put a cover over it. Um, at least a foam windscreen, if not a foam windscreen, maybe a, a bag. I would probably avoid using a plastic bag because a plastic bag could actually trap and hold moisture around the microphone, which is not what we want to do. I hope this was helpful. If you have any additional questions or comments, I encourage you to put them down below and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. If there's other topics you'd like covered, also let me know and we'll uh, consider adding that to our collection of sound advice videos. Thanks again for stopping by. I hope you choose to subscribe if you haven't already. And I look forward to seeing you once again on another episode of Sound Advice.